There are many views that human beings hold to frame the question of reality for them. The most common is nihilistic materialism, which is held by the powers that be in universities and uh, culture in general, a reductionistic system that essentially just holds reality to be whatever is observed and calculated. There are also religious systems functioning on various levels of dualism, usually a dualistic split separating a creator God entity from a creation that is finite and material, thereby separating the two. Then there are monist systems that hold either a positive or negative, in some cases, view of the absolute, but believe in the absolute as a thing, a great thing that includes all other things. Generally, the dualistic and monistic systems fall under the category of eternalism. So you have nihilistic systems, which underscore the materialistic view of most people. Then you have religious systems based in eternalism or an eternalistic belief in an absolute. And then you have what I'm doing, <clears throat> which is none of those things. And since I'm not here to talk about those things, I'm talking about something that is really fairly rare and uncommon because it doesn't subscribe to any of the views that are commonly held. And one of the fundamental uh, premises of this view is the idea of resolving reification and division, which produces duality, but also produces belief in a monad. Going beyond all of those concerns is what we're looking at in Key 23. Key 23 brings back some themes that have been mentioned in previous keys. And in the commentary in the book, you have a description of the imagery here articulated through the three basic divisions that you see in Sefer Yetzirah related to a practitioner. You have a head, a belly, and a heart between them, head, belly, and heart. However, from this point on in the discussion, and from this point on in the 32 key cycle, we're going to be concerned with what goes on in the resolution of head, heart, and belly in a very particular way. It has to do with the resolution point in the midst of this equation, in the center the heart itself, where head and belly coalesce into a view that is utterly and completely beyond the conventional limitations and parameters of what is perceived to be reality by most people. This is the shift itself, the most important part. So what do we have here in key 23? We have the belly represented as the quadrisected circle with its subset, the subset being relative appearances, the great circle in which it is um, encompassed is basic space itself, the openness of the ground and its inherent dynamic luminosity. In the heart of the belly of this image, which is the circle in its subset, you have a yud with an aleph inside of it. This is a very important symbol. Because first and foremost, what it does, since we studied already what quadrisection is in relation to a circle and what the center point means, the center point is the divine presence in the midst of the quadrisected space that we see as infinite expanse, right? What we see in this particular part of the diagram is that both the subset circle, relative appearances, and the greater circle around it, which is the expanse of basic space, they share the same heart. They share the same heart point. Both can be counted as fives in their own right through their own respective quadrisections, but that fifth point is shared. And here the fifth point is represented 
as the dynamic luminosity, or we could say the creativity of the Yud, which is complete and whole, thereby in the midst of the representation of creative awareness and luminosity, in the midst of the Yud graphically is an Aleph, the symbol of wholeness itself, primordial wholeness. So as we said in previous keys, the reconciliation of primordial wholeness, the Aleph, and primordial dynamism, the Yud, are keys to the system, are keys to the resolution of reification and division, and thereby dualistic and monistic understandings of reality that are incomplete from the perspective of this view. That's the belly of this key. That is the guts of what we have to work with, so to speak. The head of this construction is our old friend, the Tzach Tzach Ot, the face of the divine, openness, its brightness, and its sparkling resonance, which differentiates. The sparkling differentiation, the sparkling resonance never departs from the undifferentiated brightness, although it appears variable, it appears oscillating, it appears in variegation, but appearances and the reality of the situation can be quite different. So the sparkling resonance is the display of this undifferentiated brightness and the undifferentiated brightness is the luminosity of openness itself. And that's what we started out the entire 32 key cycle with in key one. So we have the tzach tzach ot as the head uh, which is crystallized into limitations in a human being noticed as the limiting constraints and barriers of the mind and its capacity to perceive reality. And you have the belly, which contains within it dynamic wholeness. And as we've stated before, the relationship between these two is that fire is drawn from the belly. Fire in this case is life force itself. Life force goes through various refinements from intellectual understanding, to feeling tone, to textural patterning, to luminosity itself, and ultimately to the openness of the ground. And through these types of fire, the blazing comes up, melts the crystallized mercury salts that conceal the true nature of the head. It regains its original fluidity and drips down. And the flame and the dripping crystalline dew of secret mercury meet in the heart and coalesce into what will be the alchemical stone, the philosopher's stone, which we will talk about at the end of the cycle. That's pretty much the subject that we're going to talk about for the rest of the 32 keys, the fruit of practice. The methodology of practice is the blazing up and dripping down. The fruit of the practice is what happens as a relation uh, uh, in relation to that. So, these are things that have been said before, but now in key 23, we're playing for keeps. The stakes are much higher. The view is a matter not of understanding theory and philosophy or even technique. Techniques and philosophies are important, but what is employed here is a living view whereby reality abides within that view and proves it to be either true or false. Realization is the proving true of the view that we hold. So in the heart of this arrangement, as the key shows us here, is the resolution of the sun and the moon. In other words, well, let's go back a step. What do the sun and moon usually imply? The sun and moon usually imply a causal relationship. Something blazes, something reflects it, and back and forth because the two are seen as separate entities in relation to each other. If you look at the diagram 
to the right of the key, you see our old friend from key number three, I think it was, where I make a very important point about these two bodies in relation to each other, the sun and the moon. The sun and the moon here are both marked with an aleph because they are aspects of wholeness itself and are not separate from each other. Although they appear to be things appear to be separate moments in time and locations and space and individual thoughts and feelings, individual abstract ideas appear to be separate entities in relationship with one another. And if you observe the field of appearance this way, you can only conclude that there is a real fragmentation going on with the various aspects of phenomena. But what our view informs us and what we strive to prove is correct is that wholeness, the wholeness of the ground is complete and absolute. And absolute not in the way that a monist would hold the absolute to be true and correct, meaning a real divine presence that's either positive or negative. Our understanding of wholeness of the Aleph goes beyond positive and negative, goes beyond is and is not, existence and non-existence. And we see the ground as an incomprehensibly magical array of interactive possibilities that the Aleph infinitely echoes itself without ever leaving itself, thereby both the radiant openness and the capacity to reflect it are the same ground, echoing without reflexivity. If they were separate, the relationship between them would be a reflexive relationship. And we've already proven in the first set of keys that this is not a reflexive scenario. And the view of re reflexivity is inherently wrong because its bias is based in the logic of the body-mind, in the logic of separate things and separate ideas and separate times and separate places. And that's our habit. And you can't blame human beings for abiding to their habits <clears throat> when nothing else is known beyond them. So you could say that the infinite capacity for the moon to echo the blazing openness of the sun produces a, a, a magical dimension of phenomena in a non-reflexive register, which echoes itself infinitely. And that infinite variation never leaves wholeness. It is a presentation of wholeness. It is wholeness itself. When we subscribe to the idea of wholeness, we are subscribing to the absolute nature of the ground, which is the or and sof, the light of and sof. But what is particular about our view here is that we do not separate the openness of the or and sof from its light, from its dynamic luminosity, that we don't hold an emanationist view whereby the ground emits luminosity and dynamism and spits it out to step down and go on to create worlds within worlds within worlds on separate rungs of the ladder, each one being a diminishment or a reduction from the previous one until you hit the bottom of the ladder. That's the common emanationist view. And the root of it is the idea that the ground of Ensof creates a light out of itself that it inhabits, but in a reductionistic mode. And that creation of light thereby goes on to do whatever it does. We're saying something very, very different. We're saying that although all the relative differences of the echoes within the worlds, within worlds and the worlds, they certainly appear. And they certainly appear creatively in the luminosity of the ground. 
However, that luminosity has never left its inherent openness. The or and sof, the or part, the light part, has never left the end sof, that which is n without sof, end or limit, that which is infinite without end. So if the light has never left n sof and is essentially n sof blazing its own sublime mystery, then what we have here in our understanding of the view is that anything and everything, and even nothing, is a display of this non-reflexive relationship whereby the blazing openness of the sun reflects itself in the lunar capacity and nothing has ever left anything else, deviated from anything else, separated or stepped down or reduced itself. And this is why both the sun and the moon in this arrangement are labeled with an aleph, primordial wholeness itself. There are certain systems that hold to primordial conceptions of wholeness, either as a positive absolute or a negative absolute. But let's take the most extreme esoteric example where there are systems and I'm not going to name them and get into that whole discussion, but there are systems that hold to an inherent nothingness alone and either reject or ignore all appearances and essentially just strive to realize the nothingness state. And in these systems, they are adhering to a very similar view of the essence of the ground, as I'm speaking about. However, they're doing so in an incomplete manner. They're correct, technically, that the ground is a nothingness fullness. As long as you understand that your nothingness is not an absence, right? An is not as opposed to an is, right? As long as you're talking about in undifferentiated wholeness, because if undifferentiated wholeness has no reflexive counterpoint, right? If there is no reflexive um, um, referent for something to be related to something else or set against something else, a subject perceiver from a perceived object, what you would have is a nothingness because nothing can be defined. True undifferentiation is a nothingness from the perspective of the mind because you can't define anything about it, any quality, any attribute, any place, any substance, any time, any idea, so on and so forth. And that is essentially true, but all of this still appears. What do you do with that? Well, there are those systems that either reject it or ignore it. That's not what I'm doing. And that's not what I'm talking about because obviously the echoing of the infinite ground within itself arises as infinite variations of luminous dynamism and creativity, which is essentially life force brought to its ultimate intensity. And when life force is brought to its ultimate intensity, it recognizes itself as pure awareness. But the question is, from the perspective of pure openness. What is this awareness if there is no one to be aware and no thing to be aware of? Well, it would be a nothingness. There's nothing that you could say about it. So why do we even call it awareness? We call it awareness because the echoing produces the contrivance of infinite realms and the infinite realms are infinite sets of patterns. And within the infinite sets of patterns where life force expresses itself, a situation is contrived whereby the infinite seems, appears to be hidden and concealed within the finite. The recovery or the resurrection, one could say, or the restoration of an understanding of infinite dynamic wholeness in the ground in the midst of the game of hide and seek is the job of a practitioner and the purpose to it all from the perspective of this view. 
So the seed of this recognition of the infinite within the array of contrived finite disguises, the echoes of the luminosity of the ground as it conceals itself within itself on all possible registers. This is what is realized when causality, the reflexive assumptions about the sun and moon are resolved in the heart of practice. This is what we're talking about here. When we're talking about the sun and moon in practice, what we are talking about is the interaction between the contrasts that articulate differences and those contrasts within the life force are known, and I've mentioned that they are known, as the aspects of the red and white drops in relation to each other, the chasing between them, which produces the tension and the energy of desire as the red drop seeks to reconcile itself within the white drop and the white drop seeks to reconcile itself within the red drop. And this is a symbolic way of describing the endless pursuit of resolution that never gets resolved within the worlds that miss the heart point of the ground. The aspect of the sun becomes the red drop, the aspect of the moon becomes the white drop. When the red drop expresses itself in its own way, in its own activity within manifestation, it becomes the blazing fire of sulfur. When the white drop expresses itself in its own way in manifestation. It becomes the fluidity of mercury. Mercury, as we know, devolves to a salt when it freezes or locks itself out of its own inherent motion. The blaze of the sulfur is that which becomes limited as a result of that and expresses a limited capacity to blaze. In its complete blazing, the red drop is the solar understanding of the Oren Sof and uh, the mercury when it's realized for what it truly is, is the secret mercury, the ultimate fluidity of the open fullness that expresses itself through its luminosity. That's what's resolved in the heart as life force is drawn out of concealment from the belly, melts the crystallized mercury salts, which as you see in key 23 are actually the tzach tzach oat. They are the very highest expression of the divine. And as the dripping down and blazing up meet in the heart, you get the realization of a spark of luminal darkness, a spark of the sublime that abides within the heart and grows there. But here is the problem. If we believe that the ground is complete and whole and absolute and reality itself is only this open fullness, what is a head? What is a belly? What is a heart? What is a being? What is a world? Obviously, what is being melted away is the belief that separate beings and separate realms at separate times and separate locations and separate ideas actually exist. So what is being melted away, contrary to what many esoteric systems would hold as really their their most refined truth, <laughs> the what is being melted away is belief in the microcosm and the macrocosm. Now, of course, I'm not saying that microcosmic and macrocosmic expressions don't appear. Of course they appear. We can list endless correspondences that map them out and they are truly appearing. They truly appear. But what is their ultimate transcendental reality? What is their ultimate essence? Well, in asking that question, when you ask the question of the ultimate essence of a thing, remember Marcus Aurelius, what is a thing in and of itself, right? 
And then you ask that question from the standpoint of modern physics and uh, reductionistic observation of nihilistic materialism, you're faced with the same question at every turn, no matter what view you hold, you're asking the same question. The only issue is how deeply you're asking that question. What is the essence of all of this? If you are satisfied quite easily at observational logic and conclusions based off observation and you seek no further, there's the answer that you've settled upon. What we're doing is taking it to its absolute extreme that we're saying that the resolution of this doesn't come with any kind of conclusion whatsoever. It comes in something that goes beyond nothingness. Because if you just settled on nothingness, you would have that negative monistic answer, and that would be your absolute. We're saying there is no absolute. There is no absolute as an absolute, <laughs> we could say. However, there are absolute answers to the nature of the ground that can't be frozen into the conception of an absolute. You follow that statement. So what do we do? We know that the blazing up of the sulfur and the flowing or dripping down of the mercury resolves itself in the heart. And what is dripping down is the tzaksak oat, which is the root of the life force that has blazed up. They are essentially two aspects of the same thing, just as the sun and moon are two aspects of the same thing. But that thing is not a thing. It's inherently open. That's why we started the entire key cycle with openness, because you don't want to freeze the absolute into an absolute condition or source. Because if the absolute becomes the source of all things, then all you have is a system of causality where the source produces various effects. And you always go back to the source because the source is a, is a foundation point. We're resolving causality when we resolve the sun and the moon in the heart. And we are essentially saying that the open expanse of Ensof and the creative brilliance of its awareness light are one in the same. Just as the sun and moon are one in the same, the ground and its luminosity, the openness and its luminosity are the same. And it's recognized as a spark that coalesces in the heart of a being. So when we say the heart of a being, what does that mean? And here's where two convergent methodologies will be discussed. There is certainly a reaction that happens in the psychoetheric physical and mental body of a practitioner during contemplation where something does blaze up the central channel and something does drip down from the head. Some systems would say four fingers above the head. Other systems would say an arm's length above the head. Doesn't matter. Head, belly, and heart is a scenario where the blazing up and the dripping down and the coalescence in the heart marks transformation in the appearance of a being. But those same fundamental precepts apply to the overall field beyond location. So we could say that as the field is contemplated deeply, an intensity blazes up from nowhere. And crystallizing salts melt seated nowhere, and the dripping down meets the blaze in the heart of the field beyond location. So head, belly, and heart certainly pertain, in a sense, to what appears to be a microcosm, this display, but also to the display of the field in a macrocosmic sense. If we go beyond microcosm and macrocosm, they come back to the same fundamental gesture of contemplation which is not to say that either one is denied. We could talk about the macrocosmic implications of the frozen salts of worlds that we don't have access to melting and dripping down and thereby producing within the Hishtalshulus the capacity for growth through the worlds. That certainly appears, just as we could say that the mercury salts within brain-based consciousness 
melt and the blazing of life force meets them in the heart, which is certainly something that thinking and feeling benefit from and the changes within the functionality of a being prove this. So we could note these macrocosmic and microcosmic changes, but they're all relative and provisional. The absolute basis of this is in the ground itself. So how, while we're noticing that this activity is taking place, this being described in Key 23, how do we bring it past our biases for microcosmic and macrocosmic applications? Because the intellect is always seeking to reduce these symbols to those terms. That's a perfectly understandable habit that we're seeking a set of correspondences to make a logical sense out of all of this. And if I tell you that what goes on in the subtle body of a practitioner and what goes on in the field of appearance in a macrocosmic sense are actually the same gesture, not two separate gestures. What I'm essentially saying is exactly what the sun and moon are seeking to resolve here. What things seem to be and what they actually are are two different things. And the reflexive division between things is what is actually being resolved. The causality between those relationships are what is being resolved at the root. So as we said in the past two keys, I believe, this comes down to a resolution of the so-called beginning and so-called end of the numeral cycle. The one, which is absolute wholeness, and the dynamic potency of the 10, which is the sum total of its dynamic power, the Yud and the Aleph. They are one and the same, just as the sun and the moon are one and the same. If you've understood what this symbol of the sun and moon marked with the olives is saying is that they're both aspects of the wholeness that echoes itself without leaving itself. Then we could take that even further, that we could go through a set of intervals that prove certain points about the nature of manifestation that are stated in the fountain of wisdom. They're derived from the fountain of wisdom. And they will be used extensively to explain the fruit of practice as it is expressed and realized in the remaining keys. And I've listed them to the right here, that we have two different types of considerations where we equalize the Aleph and the Yud or the sun and the moon or the head and the belly that establishes the spark of sublime divinity within the heart. And these two different types of considerations are explained in terms of the path and the realization of the path. The path is, the, is based on the idea that we still carry with us the bias of the body-mind and the fragmentation and the tendency towards reification that comes with that. And we're working through it. On the level of the path, transformation is happening. Alchemical transmutation is changing us. That we find ourselves in various limiting states and we strive to work through them. That's what the path does. The path is in a sense, working from the side of our actual state, our current state that needs what we call tikkun or restoration or repair. In other words, it's operating within a process that appears linear and dualistic. We are here, we're seeking to go elsewhere with our being. That aim, that great aim known as the great work is realized beyond the steps and stages of any linear breakdown of a transformative process. As a matter of fact, that realization is beyond process itself. It is complete and whole like a lightning flash, absolute and intact, always, already from the outset. That you could say, for example, that when the Aleph is known as the sun and moon, 
Are we reconciling the sun and the moon by realizing that they are the same? No, they were always already the same. It was our own habit that made a mistake that thought that they were different. You could say the same thing about microcosm and macrocosm, about the head and the belly that are resolved in the heart. These differences are a mistake that we are in the process of resolving. So the path leads us to a realization that doesn't have to be fabricated or created. It's always already true and absolute. And absolute in the sense meaning definitive and not provisional, not in the sense of there being an absolute, like a creator God would be absolute. So let's go through these intervals that prove and express the equalization of the Aleph and the Yud. And this is what is resolved in the heart as the sun and moon are realized for what they truly are. From the perspective of the path, we contemplate the original ground. We contemplate the Aleph. That's our starting point from the perspective of the path. The first thing that you do on the path is learn what wholeness actually means, that it is open, that it is openness, and it expresses its luminosity without leaving itself. Key number one, if this is intellectually understood, you have the most important foundation for everything that will follow already intact. It's actually very difficult to understand this completely and fully. When we reduce it to a mere philosophy, we might say, yes, that's a very nice idea that um, the original ground is complete and whole and everything I look at is the ground, but then we have to contend with our actual state which is two seconds after we have thought about that philosophical precept, we get caught up in something, we desire something, we either like or dislike something, and we're back to a war between the red drop and the white drop, chasing each other around and essentially fighting with each other. And our view of the original ground is out the window until we remember it again as a philosophical precept. This is the problem of the intellect. But it's where we have to start on the level of the path. Once we understand intellectually that the original ground is complete and whole, we understand something about the sun and the moon. We understand that in a non-reflexive way, the openness blazes and its capacity to seemingly echo itself or reflect itself is infinite. And through that dynamic tension, we have luminosity arising between openness and its natural fullness, which is exuded in, in an infinite array of possibilities. It is actually the question of possibility in an open-ended manner. And that is inherently the seed of awareness. So if we understand the original ground of the Aleph, we could look at the graphic shape of the Aleph and see that there are two yuds that are echoing each other within that wholeness. So to understand the original ground is to understand the original ground of all echoes, and to understand luminosity itself, and to understand life force and awareness as being nothing other than that. On the level of the path, if you contemplate the original ground, completely and fully, you can move to the next phase of the path, which is the contemplation of the enworlding echo, that that echo where Aleph appears as Aleph, Aleph, sun and moon, the echo echoes itself. And when the echo, which is two, echoes itself, becoming four, you have quadrisection. You have the cardinal directions of space. You essentially have the map of infinite expanse. So Aleph becomes, the, it doesn't become, Aleph is inherently the capacity to echo itself. And when that inherent capacity to echo itself becomes enworlding, when the echo becomes enworlding, you have an understanding of infinite expanse that changes your understanding of space, changes your understanding of expanse itself and expansiveness itself. Then in the heart and center, and when I say heart and center, I'm talking just as the 
encompassing great circle and the subset circle within it share the same heart in the sense of the heart of the array of appearance microcosm and macrocosm share the same heart and that heart is not divisible it is an indestructible wholeness in the midst of reality which is not a location it finds itself wherever appearance appears and at that heart point which is situated in the midst of quadrisection we have the indwelling divinity that is the fifth point so Aleph, which is inherently full of the potential to echo, enworlds itself by echoing the echo, and the heart in the midst of that expanse is found. That's the indwelling divinity that is referred to as Shekhinah. Shekhinah is associated with the fifth point, five being the numerical value of the letter He. So you see, on the level of path, I'm giving you a series of steps to explain the elaboration of the ground within itself. It's on the level of path because it's steps and stages, right? Once we have some understanding of Shekhinah, the indwelling divinity that is always inherently in the midst of infinite echoing expanse, we realize that that produces the scenario of the infinite concealing itself within the finite. In other words, that scenario, that five-fold scenario of quadrisected expanse and its center echoes itself. And these are the two haze of the divine name, that you have a quadrisected circle inside another quadrisected circle, ultimately echoing into infinity. And there's always the expanse of the cardinal directions and there's always the center no matter where it's postulated to be in location or assumed to arise in time or thought about in terms of the vector of an idea which always has an expanse and a heart in center when it's considered in abstraction same thing is true in in pure abstract conceptuality that there is indwelling divinity at the heart of the enworlding echo, and that creates a subset of itself. And that subset is how worlds are formed within other worlds. And this accounts for the function of how the concentric circle diagrams work in the Illinois, the Kabbalistic diagrams. So we have Aleph, which is inherently doubling. Aleph is never less than two, as the Fountain of Wisdom says. And that never less than two echo echoes itself in worlding itself. The center is always there to be found, there to be realized and discovered. And that scenario also echoes itself. The complete whole five-fold array of the Shekhinah echoes itself as the subset and that's our map. So in these four steps that I've just mentioned, we have a path description of how to make the map of reality that explains this view, which essentially is the quadrisected circle and subset with a common heart binding the greater and lesser circles together. That's the heart where the work is actually done. At that heart, we have the two quadrisected expanses with their heart point counted together, five and five making 10. That's the yud. That's the spark of the dynamic creativity, which was inherent in the Aleph from the outset. That's the dynamic potency that does all of this. When the original ground and the primordial spark at the heart of the original ground are reconciled, you have complete wholeness understood dynamically. On the level of the path, this is proven through this circuit of letters and intervals that I've just laid out. But there is no progression. It's always complete and whole. The Aleph and the Yud are inherently one in the same. Although 
On the level of path, we prove to ourselves that this is the case by going through a progression. But the progression is an illusion from the standpoint of the body-mind bias. The realization is that the openness of the Aleph and the luminosity of the Yud are always inherently um, innate within each other beyond beginning and end. And that's the realization. Now, each of these intervals, and there are five of them here, pertains to one of the facets of what we call pure view. Pure view is the realization of the lightning flash when the ground is realized inherently as infinite variation outside of time, outside of spatial location, outside of even concept. We have five terms that I've mentioned to you before that snap into focus the virtues of infinite variation because we don't have an implicit belief in a nothingness that causes us to reject or ignore appearance. Appearance is the means whereby this is proven. We prove this by contemplating phenomena as it is without wanting to change it. Its inherent perfection, its inherent sublime divinity is on display. The habit field becomes realized as a wonder field if the view is drawn out and realized to its ultimate conclusion. And that becomes what we call the five purities. That's the realization that the path takes us to. So each of these intervals pertains to a different aspect of these purities. Aleph, the contemplation of the original ground. When it is truly realized, what appears to be substantial is realized to be substanceless. Substancelessness is what we call chazhazet, the true nature of the image that arises in the mirror. It has no substance, even though it appears to have substance. It is complete and whole, even though it appears to be broken into an infinite series of bits. That's the chazhazet, substanceless solidity. If you understand and can contemplate the original ground, the world around you is nothing other than the ground. That's the chazhazet. That's the true message of the Aleph. If the enworlding echo of quadrisection is truly understood and realized for what it actually is, dimensionality and the cohesion of separate dimensions is purified and mitigated. And the throne of light, the Kalipa Noga, which appears to be a barrier and set of conceptual membranes involved in reification and division and the habits of the mind is purified and is nothing other than the ground permeating itself with its own luminosity. It becomes literally the seat of the divine, the throne of the divine light, that the enworlding echo, which is the expanse, has a whole different understanding. Because under the, the ordinary habits of body-mind appearance, the enworlding expanse is a separate set of places. Each individual point becomes its own place. Each individual discovery because it becomes its own moment in time. And this is not only true within the material dimension, but between all dimensions. So if we purify the enworlding echo, which is the quadrisected Aleph, we purify the, we can realize the throne of light in its pure state as an aspect of pure vision, a non-dimensional cohesion of expanse. Truly an aspiration which is extremely subtle. On the level of the path that contemplates the divinity that dwells within that expanse, we realize that that divinity cannot be reduced to any process or activity that is either done to us from outside or done from us from the inside. In other words, the process of creation, the process of something having created us or we creating ourselves. In other words, 
the timeline of beginnings and ends, birth and death. When we realize the truly transcendental nature of this indwelling divinity, we realize the arafal, that which can't be reduced to any point within a process of transformation, or even to transformation itself as it's commonly understood. This is where our understanding of process and transformation and alchemy itself goes into the apophatic register that in the Arafal, what we have is the fire that burns away linear designation of conceptual points in an order. In other words, an atemporal understanding of appearance and transformation that is utterly and completely different from that which we assume is change in a normal sense. This is the true realization that change is the divine unchanging presence. And what appears to change is merely provisional and relative, even though it appears and its true nature is actually changeless and not relative or provisional at all, but definitive and absolute in the sense of the ground. When this is applied to the subset of our own scenario, this presentation of appearance that seems to be the world that contains us within it, the assumed subset of an expanse which is unseen, when an atemporal, non-dimensional, substanceless understanding of reality is presented, it is completely and totally beyond concept, beyond our capacity to conceptualize it. The virtues of this realization at this point are realized in a non-conceptual register. And this is the root of motion, non-conceptual motility, that if we understand the previous step, a temporal transformation, in the Arafal, what is burned away is the idea that we can grasp at any point within a timeline, with any transformative process that denotes change. The Hashmal is the pure dynamic assertion beyond concept, beyond reduction of the root of what appears to change. The key to that is the realization that it's changeless. If you try to degenerate that into a philosophy, that there is a changeless root at the heart of all change, it's a nice idea, but that ain't the Hashmal. The Hashmal comes about through the realization of your actual state and your actual state appears to be moving, appears to be dynamically changing. What are you gonna do with that with your philosophy? Ultimately, you have to come back to what you seem to be. When that realization pervades every aspect of your life force and echoes forth as the appearance of everything you know and assume to be real, there is this Hashmal transmission of pure wisdom, non-conceptual wisdom that burns away and washes and purifies all the vestiges of the body-mind bias and phenomena is reborn, understood anew literally a rebirth of everything. This is what is known as tikkun olam, the repair of the world, the total repair of reality, which is not a philosophy or even a technique. What it is, is a realization that is discovered as the work is done, blazing up from life force and dripping down as limitations are melted away layer upon layer upon layer as the path progresses. And what is realized from the path is realized in the heart, at the spark of luminal darkness, which is the inherent divinity that is always already there. This is on the level of Keter, the marvelous light, the pervading openness, fullness, that is the spark of the Yud that can be discovered already blazing in the heart of not only what perceives itself to be the microcosm, 
but the macrocosmic assumption of a universe in which it is placed. Hopefully, from the perspective of path and the realization of that path, these intervals which describe the cultivation of the philosopher's stone, the cultivation of realization and gnosis, hopefully they can be found in this diagram because we've talked about these things throughout the keys, but now at this point, at key 23, we're talking about living it through, making it real. Realization is literally making it real through the lived through experience of discovery and ultimately even discovery, which is a transformative process that's on the path, goes away in a lightning flash because what is realized is even beyond the level of transformative discovery. The realization is beyond even alchemy because what is being transformed into what else, right? Everything that you need is already inherently the case. But then there's the question of our actual state. Wholeness echoes itself without ever leaving itself. And that dynamic tension, that luminosity must be worked through resistance by resistance. So we're on the path, but incrementally we cultivate realization one spark at a time. And ultimately these sparks are understood and are realized as aspects of a great spark that includes all possible variables, a spark that is no longer part of something, but is in and of itself the luminosity of the whole. And that's what the Yud truly represents in its wholeness. That is what is liberated as secret mercury through our practice. The secret mercury is the Tzach Tzach Ot, is the Oren Sof. That's what awakens in the heart when the blazing of the life force does its work. Now, from the perspective of the path, we have to honor our resistances in the sense that we don't want to diminish them. We don't want to say, oh, well, they're untrue because they're just on the level of relative provisional reality. Everything is already inherently the divine and is actually perfect. Therefore, I don't have to do any work. This is also extremely common that people understand that aspect of the view, which is true technically, but do something which is an egregious non-expression of that view, which is they ignore their actual state. Your actual state tells the story of your realization, the level of your grasping, the level of your concretization in substance, in dimensions and time in concept and how you hold existence and non-existence as precepts. Ultimately, your expression of reality is borne out by what is true to you. And if you live in a fantasy based on philosophies and techniques and don't address the coarseness of your actual state, the work won't have any value. You'll create a fantasy out of it. And it's very common to say everything's one, everything's only the ground. This glass is just the ground. My understanding of the glass is the ground. And isn't that wonderful? Okay, fine. It's not essentially untrue. What happens two seconds later when the body mind's reactivity kicks in and that philosophy seems to have gone out the window in a moment of, uh, habituation. So stable realization, which is the idea that the lived through expressiveness of the ground pervades all phenomena beyond locations in space and moments in time. And one does not fall back into the reification and division of habit patterns. That's stable realization. That's what crystallizes in the heart with the philosopher's stone. However, for those of us who are on the path, there's a process of realizing sparks and then falling back into habituation, back and forth and back and forth. That's why it's a path. 
tikkun olam, stable realization, is an aspiration that we all have. But it's probably counterproductive to think about it too much in the service of working the path when what would expedite matters in a far better way is addressing your actual state, what seems to be happening in reality that is at hand immediately and directly in every moment. In every moment, one strives for realization and one finds obstacles and obstructions. And that's where your striving for the great aim of the great work becomes path. You work through it. This insurmountable obstacle is actually substanceless solidity, non-dimensionality, atemporal, beyond concept, pervaded with an openness fullness that is beyond existence or non-existence. The time to put that to the test is when the obstacles come up, not in your private philosophical speculation when everything seems to be going perfectly in a fantasy of, of your own practice, but actually in the meat and, and bone and blood of daily life. <laughs> So, although philosophies and techniques are extremely valuable on the path, ultimately the realization is beyond philosophies and techniques. If there are any questions, now's the time. I, I accept that my noticing of what I'm about to say is contrary to uh, the essence of what you were sharing today and you've been sharing uh, since we've been meeting, but a realization or what I noticed was a sense of being breathed as opposed to breathing. Um, so my question is, seeing through the eyes or the heart of the whole field, not just uh, the subset that is my habit field. Um, is, is there a recognition that breath is one of the playgrounds within which all of these changes take place? I mean, you, you, you said micro and macro, I, I, I get that. It's just that what happened here today and why I'm gobsmacked is because my sense was so I was here to, to, to notice it is that uh, I stopped breathing and, and I guess recognized that maybe I wasn't the one doing the breathing. And I don't mean that in the biological sense. So my question is, what uh, the hell is going on? Well, don't stop breathing, Howard. <laughs> you remember, you asked a similar question yeah, I did, um, at yeah. one point. Yeah. And the answer I gave you is the same answer I'll give you now, which is yeah. that from the methodology of this work and simple system, substitute the word mind for breath yeah. and make it an issue of awareness, but still as the ruach. Ruach literally is the breath and the wind of what you're talking about. So this system is breathing mind through each engagement of phenomena which posits a boundary when yeah. you perceive a thought or a sense perception or you feel an internal feeling or have an idea what defines it is some sort of boundary that shapes the vessel that's the subset beyond the subset which is the greater circle is something that we can't even say is an unknown. It is literally unknowable. And this is why the shift really happens at the level of the Arafal, the indwelling divinity, when you approach phenomena through its heart essence indwelling divinity, the aspect of the Shekhinah. All our assumptions of what things are or our interpretation of them 
is burned away. It is literally a burning away of that which can be known in the bath, in the immersion of that which is unknowable. And it's for that reason that in these intervals, Aleph, quadrisected Alephs, hey, double hey, yud, in that set of intervals, the hey is in the middle. It's the heart of the heart. It's the indwelling divinity of the entire system. And it's no accident that it corresponds to this apophatic level of the arafal, because from in the transition between the subset and the greater circle, there is an utter and complete annihilation of everything that the mind thinks and feels that it is doing. That's the bath. The bath is ultimately an apophatic experience. But even the word experience is incorrect because with no one to do the experiencing and no thing or state to be experienced, there is a, I don't want to say state of nothingness because it's not a mere absence. It's a fullness so complete that it devastates and annihilates our capacity to get our bearings. That's where the breath goes. When you breathe, you are breathing in that annihilating divine presence utterly and completely beyond comprehension, and you are drawing it in and exhaling it to make what stands between the inhale and the exhale utterly transparent to it. And if there is even one single thing left between the inhale and the exhale, meaning your body, your psyche, your concepts, your feelings, whatever it is, your disposition. If there's anything between the inhale and the exhale, the job has not been done completely. And between the inhale and the exhale, meaning the, the, the transparency that we're talking about here that, is, that we're striving to realize, there can't be any opacity left. And the opacity is everything that you use to define yourself. This is me. This is my mind. This is my life. I was born. I will die, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm not denying those appearances. I'm just saying that they're not true. <laughs> so yes, you can, you can breathe your way through this as long as you understand that the breath itself is an inherently annihilating fire that utterly consumes thingness substantiality, dimensionality, temporality, conceptuality. That's, that's the wood that's, that's the kindling that's thrown in the fire. Every building block in the construction of your life is ultimately thrown into this fire. Either you throw it in or you don't. And most people, they throw in a little bit and they think, well, maybe I'll keep this one part over here. <laughs> and, you know, I, I am not anybody's well, I have no responsibility to anybody. So I'm just telling you, it's up to mm -hmm. you to do it. I can't, you know, go over to your house like a French nun and hit you with a ruler because you're not <laughs> annihilating yourself uh, sufficiently. <laughs> Nor could I, you know, be a, a fire and brimstone preacher yelling at you to do it because that just simply doesn't work. You just simply get yelled at and then go back to what you're doing. So, you know, I'm just telling you and you take it and you do whatever you're going to do with it. I had a question from last week. I couldn't find out on my own at the top of the key. The Zatzak Olt is uh, displayed as three interlocking circles. Yeah. And you had referred to that briefly as the three worlds. And um, oh, I've those studied... are two different things. Don't confuse those two things. Like what Great. we yeah, what we see here with openness, brightness, and the sparkling resonance, that's the Sak Sak Ot. Essentially, that's modeled after the Spherot of Keter Chokmah and Bina in Correct. a way. That's why yeah. I, I represent it that way graphically, because people will have that association. Although it's not limited to Keter Chokmah and Bina, it's modeled that way so we could approach it in a common symbolic way that everyone can understand and relate to. In the previous key, those three interlocking vertical circles pertain to the rebirthing of the world that comes from Keter, which is Bria, Yetzirah, and Asiya. 
So those I, were the I, three worlds you were referring to. Yeah, when I when I refer okay. to the triple worlds, I'm talking about the scenario whereby most people associate reality in space time with energies and appearances. And the field of phenomena is what is being reborn. So in that key, key 22, it's cracking out of the apex of the egg, the reborn triple world. But that relates to the worlds of Bria, Yetzir, and Asaya. It's very different than the Sak Uh The question would be, is falling back from the view considered the same thing as reflex reflexivity or contraction or the coarseness of obstacles or thingness? Yeah. Are all it, those it things the same? It absolutely is. Yeah. Reflexivity which is essentially the dualistic impulse at the heart of what we perceive as um, um, substantial solidity or individual uh, separate places in space and moments in time and the differentiation of concepts and ultimately the difference between existence and non-existence. Like all of the things that reify and divide every aspect of the reality field come down to this principle of reflexivity, which reifies and divides, separates things, articulates contrasts. So if you take reflexivity as the seed of that, which produces falling back into habit patterns because it reifies and divides them, then we have to resolve that. Yes, that is the reason why the falling back happens. And it's resolved at the root. And in this particular case of this key, we're framing the resolution of that mechanism as an ultimate resolution between the sun and the moon. It doesn't stop the sun and the moon from appearing differently as parts of appearance. However, what changes is their meaning. If we understand the sun and the moon from an ordinary perspective of meaning, they're two different reflexive entities that engage in a reflexive relationship. And the implications of that are on the levels of substance and place and time and concept and everything that makes reality real to us. But if we shift the meaning to a non-reflexive appearance display, the sun and the moon can interact in infinite variation, do whatever they're going to do, and there's no problem whatsoever. So the difference is a difference in meaning. And the falling back is a falling back to a habitual meaning that gives reality the qualities of conventional associations. So what we're really talking about is the old paradigm of one ground but within that one ground, two paths and two results are possible. One is ordinary and reflexive, and the other is magical, inherently magical. If we honor the inherently magical, sublime nature of phenomena, there is no reflexivity, despite the fact that infinite echoes of sun and moon appear. That's a very different meaning for what reality is than the ordinary one, because the ordinary one, the ordinary reflexive meaning to reality only goes to one place and it ain't good. It leads to suffering and despair and alienation because every part is separate from every other part. How could you blame a human being or any kind of being for ending up in despair when you live in a world of separate, unrelated pieces. It's just the natural consequence of that. So falling back is a falling back to misery, <laughs> falling back to suffering. It's, it's hellish when you think of the implications of this. It's not just a, a philosophical tweak of meaning that we're subscribing to this, this nice new idea. We're playing for our lives here. You know, it, it's either phenomena are divine or they're essentially meaningless. It's frightening. 
it is so incredibly frightening to think of the stakes of the game, right? And it's all up to you and it's seated within your own heart. So falling from that, which we have to do on the path again and again and again, realizing the repercussions of that is why we fall from view and then seek to correct it because we care, because we realize that the repercussions are just too great. The implications of our practice is just um, too profoundly devastating to ignore. So when we fall and we will, we remember the view, we act in accordance with the view, and we seek the true meaning of phenomena within phenomena. Good question, Mr. Alex. So anybody else? I've got one quick one, please. Um, the hay looks to be constructed out of uh, a vav and, and at least one yud or possibly two yuds. Which... Well, there's, there's two ways to construct a hay, a dalit and a vav and a dalit oh, and a yud. They both ultimately are saying the same thing in different ways. If you look at the hay, the way that I drew it here, I drew it yeah. that way for a reason, because the Dalit numerical value four and the Vav numerical value six make 10, the Yud, so inherent in the Shekhinah, the indwelling divinity at the heart of quadrisection is this heart point of the primordial spark. So you have a 10. Um, by virtue of that, you could look at the Aleph and say that it's two Yuds and a Vav, which is 26, which is the divine name which is essentially the full elaboration of the Yud or the 10 as well. So that's a bit of gematria to correct that mistake. When the Yud is represented in the type of script, I mean, excuse me, when the He is represented in the type of script that is comprised of a Dalit and a Yud instead of a Vav, that spells out the divine name Yah, Yud He, which is associated with wisdom and chokma and means essentially the same thing. There are times when one is more useful than the other. So you have these two ways of, of uh, expressing it. But here, I just wanted the plain old 10 in the five. And when you see the 10 in the five, you've got the heart of the whole view, if you understand it correctly, in the same way that it is said that somebody with true understanding in a system can know the entire contents of a book merely from observing its title. Good question. If memory serves, I don't have your, your book in front of me. Uh, the heart of the nine chambers, mm -hmm. the nine pure dynamics. Is the hay. Is the hay. Oh, yes. Okay, so, yeah. The spontaneous yeah. appearance of phenomena as a realized purity beyond space and time and concept and all division. Yes, that's the indwelling divinity at the heart of the array, just like in the nine chambers. Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, at this point, I'm going to um, have my lunch and I will see you all next week. 